the South African migration system is set for a major overhaul. The Department of Home Affairs has released a draft white paper on citizenship, immigration and refugee protection for public comment. Cabinet approved the white paper on Wednesday last week and it seeks to provide a framework on the granting of residency to foreign nationals. The proposed policy will also address the protection of refugees and asylum seekers in the country and Home Affairs um, Minister Dr. Aaron Mutsualedi joins us now virtually to expand on this particular matter. Minister, good morning and welcome to Morning Live. Good morning, Sakina, and good morning to the viewers and listeners of Morning Live. And thank you very much for having me. Absolute pleasure, Minister. So I just want to start with, you know, um, uh, some of what is contained in the uh, preamble, so to speak, your uh, remarks in that uh, uh, government white paper. So you say, among others, that in working on the white paper, an in-depth analysis of the paralysis within the Department of Home Affairs was closely scrutinized. And this involved brutal and self criticism of the current policy framework. So just talk to us about that, Minister, in terms of what you found. What is paralyzing the system and what are some of the criticisms that you are trying to address? Well, the, 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 the first and most obvious thing, Sakina, is that we have got three pieces of legislation in this area of citizenship, migration and, and refugee protection. We've got uh, the Citizenship Act enacted in 1995, one year after democracy. We have got the Refugee Act enacted in 1998, four years after democracy, and then thereafter followed by the Immigration Act in 2002. Now, unfortunately, all of them were, were enacted without an overarching policy. That means we did not put an overarching policy about uh, immigration as such. I mean, about the whole issue of migration, I mean, to say we did not have an overarching policy that correct them. So the two pieces of legislation happened separately, each of them ruling a silo uh, area of, of or, I mean, of the area that is controlling. And eventually they start contradicting each other. And just to show that there were problems. The Immigration Act was enacted in 2002. It came into operation in 2004, but there was an amendment already that year. And since then, there were four more amendments to the Immigration Act. And when you look at the amendments, you realize that they were solving a particular problem that gets realized when you start implementing the Act. You start realizing, oh, there's a gap here. Oh, there's a problem here. Now, now, obviously, when we do that, it comes something like a knee-jerk response. So the Immigration Act is such that even officials who are not lawyers but who are supposed to be guided by it easily gets very confused. The other is when you are in court, we started 47 uh, uh, judgments uh, in this area, most of which, if not all, went against the state. And it's because of what is in the legislation. And quite often, Sagina, they, 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 they contradict each other. I'm sure the, the, the easiest one you'll understand, which you yourself have been following up very closely, is the issue of the Afghan nationals who were here, who were coming to enter the country, where our lawyers fought gallantly via the Immigration Act. But... Uh, the judges showed an area in the Refugee Act which totally contradicts what they were saying. And, and these are the acts which are within the same department. So we did have very serious, we do have very serious problems in this regard. So, which is very interesting and perhaps where we can jump off, Minister, in discussing some of the provisions of this uh, discussion in the white paper. So, uh, with regard to the migration, uh, you actually go into quite some length uh, talking about how it's inevitable. Uh, you talk about, you know, um, pan-Africanism and uh, that this is still part of the cornerstone of how we uh, formulate policy as South Africa, but also... Uh, uh, you actually do go into quite some length to show what happens in other countries, not just on the continent, but elsewhere as well. When you say that, you know, uh, we must also understand essentially that 
uh, when one uh, seeks asylum or refugee status, uh, it doesn't necessarily become a permanent uh, state of affairs? Well, indeed, refugee has never meant to be permanent, Sakina. And uh, all over the world, it's never meant to be. And actually, the United Nations High Commissioner uh, for Refugees knows that in South Africa, we actually have a committee, which is a statutory committee called SCRA, Standing Committee on Refugee Affairs. It is meant to review your refugee status every four years to see whether you still need international protection, because that's what refugee means. You are under international protection because of factors, all of which are actually outlined in the United Nations Convention of 1951, which are what? Uh, that uh, if, if there is war in your country, you can run without any papers and cross a border, which is supposed to be illegal, but it becomes legal because you have got a reason to, uh, that reason being war. If there is a natural disaster, uh, like floods, fires, earthquakes, volcanoes, you can do the same. Or commonly, if you are being persecuted in that country, and there are four areas of persecution that are mentioned. You are persecuted because of your political beliefs and activities, which is what everybody knows in South Africa during the apartheid era. Or you are persecuted because of your traditional beliefs and practices, or your religious teachings and practices, or because of your sexual orientation. And, and so you, feel, you don't feel safe in that country, you run away. So interesting. So, so, so that running away cannot be permanent. Permanent. For instance, you are aware that it happened in Angola during the war of uh, 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 during that war, uh, 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 which happened in Angola after their liberation. But at some stage, United Nations announced publicly that it's over and people can go back home. The same happened in Mozambique between the war of, between Frelimo and Renamo. When it came to an end, people could go back home very safely. So refugee status all over the world is never meant to be permanent. But some of the people prefer to finally apply and become citizens, which means you can be a refugee today and a citizen tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a continuum. It is one of the reasons why, why which encourage us to realize that this act must not be separate. There must be one law. Uh, maybe with different tab chapters. That means the law about citizenship, about refugee, and about immigration must not be three separate laws. They must be. It must be one law, and we we are proposing that in the white paper. Mm. As I said, you, you, you actually draw from what other countries have done quite extensively. Uh, uh, and I'm going to read one of those uh, to you. It says, countries such as Botswana has repatriated refugees from Namibia and Zimbabwe back to their countries of origin. And this was done in collaboration with the UNHCR. The, rep rep uh, the repatriation process was challenged unsuccessfully up to the appeal court of uh, Botswana. Uh, in any event, Section 5 one of the Refugees Act provides for cessation of refugee status where change of circumstances related to the grounds for recognition has occurred. So does that suggest that uh, as South Africa in overhauling the system, uh, these are some of the things that uh, you will be dealing with as a Department of Home Affairs? Well, they, they happen all over the world, Sakina. They do happen all over the world where people are repatriated, but also uh, there is something called voluntary repatriation. Let me also add, where people say, I came here looking for asylum, and, and now I realize I, I don't have to be here, I must go back home. It's called voluntary repatriation, which is done jointly by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the International Office on Migration, and our own government, or the government of the country where it's occurring whereby if you do that voluntary repatriation, the International Office on Migration must help you. Uh, 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 buy, uh, uh, they must buy you a ticket to go back home. Actually, this is what happened in South Africa, Sakina. It's not commonly known because people are not approaching it that way. Do you remember the people who were uh, in the church, hold up in the Central Methodist Church in Cape Town? Forty of them were eventually 
deported, the magistrate agreed in court that they are claiming refugee status wrongly. There's nothing refugees about them, including the three ring leaders, one of whom, Alin Pakur, was always appearing on the media as a champion of refugees. The magistrate said we must deport them, and we did so. The remaining were given an offer by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees that if they repatriate back in their communities, the United Nations will buy them uh, 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 groceries for three months and will pay their rent for three months. And secondly, those who don't want to reintegrate into South African community can go back home via voluntary repatriation. And the International Office on Migration bought them plane tickets and sent them back home. So it does happen, yes. So, Minister, this is, of course, about acknowledging uh, the systemic weaknesses uh, that we as a country have as well that have become open to abuse uh, by criminal syndicates, among others. Uh, you also speak about acquiring of citizenship, how that system is abused, how in many instances it happens prematurely. So let's talk to that and how you are going to address uh, the corruption and abuse within the system itself. <coughs> Well, Sakina, yes, there, there, there are loopholes which are very painful, which we concede to. The, the first one, maybe for you to understand, the, the central piece of the United Nations Convention of 1951, the central piece is a concept called refoulement. It's a, it's a French word. If I have to pronounce it in French, it's refoulé. But in English, we just call it refoulement because we're not French. We, we just anglicized it, meaning you cannot take back a person back to the country where they ran away from because there's a possibility that they'll be arrested, persecuted, perhaps even executed in some of those countries that do execute people. And so you can't refoul. That's the centerpiece. And it's Article 33 of the Convention. Now, the United Nations... Even then, at that time in 1951, realized that this can never be universal. You can't just say, you can't send anybody home and, and say everybody. It's not possible. There are situations where you'll be forced to, if you are security of your country is in trouble, if somebody is causing problems in terms of law and order, if somebody is, de is disturbing public peace in that country, you have got no option. Uh, 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 in terms of, I mean, you have got no option uh, in the interest of stability and public peace in your country. You must take that person home. So the United Nations added subsection 2 of that uh, article uh, 33. Section 1 being you can't foul. Subsection 2 showing the conditions and circumstances under which you can indeed refoul. So the biggest mistake we did is that in 1998, when we domesticated that part of the act, we domesticated subsection one, which you, can, you say cannot foul. Subsection two, which must cover you, is not there in our domestic legislation. So you can't use it, meaning what? You start getting trouble with, from international thugs, like, uh, 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 uh. you remember that fellow from uh, Czechoslovakia? I don't know why I'm... Rotovan Kretscher. Yes, you start getting them taking you to court, even when they are known international facts and giving you a tough time in court. Then you have got Vito Palazzolo from Italy some decades, some two decades ago after democracy. Then recently, you know the story of Fulgen Skyshima from, from Rwanda, where Interpol and United Nations have to come here to help us search for him and take him to court and all that. If he took us alone in terms of that act, that we can't, uh, we can't refoul him. It was going to be very tough, and, and yet, you know, it's a very serious genocide. There is a tag. Fulkian Skyshima uh, was a police officer in Rwanda during the genocide in 1994. He, he uh, 2,000 women and children during that genocide ran into a church as a refugee. Everybody in every country will believe the church is safe, is the safest place, even though in today's world, it doesn't seem to be, but 2,000 women and children ran there, and, and, and he put the church on fire. When, while it was burning, he, he was not even satisfied. He went to look for these big earth removers and collapsed the wall inside and ran to South Africa 
to, re, to, to look for refugee status. And, and he was given refugee in South Africa because of the weakness of our legislation. Anyway, he has been caught now, he's in jail. So I'm just giving this few examples that we can't do that like that. Now you yourself, I want to remind you, because I know you are going to remember it very well. When we had this saga of Afghan nationals, you learned that they passed from Pakistan. They, they went to Pakistan from Afghanistan, then to Qatar, then to Zimbabwe, then to Zambia. But they only asked for asylum here in South Africa. I remember you asking their lawyer exactly why. Why do they choose South Africa? And on, in all those other countries, never applied for asylum. Do you still remember what he said to you? He said to have studied the laws of all yes. these countries and yes, and discovered that the easiest to enter is South Africa. Basically, he was talking about our immigration and refugee laws. Mm. I do remember that, Minister. Minister, we're fast running out of time, so there's quite a bit to look into here, and I'm sure we will unpack it as we go along because it is open for comment. But uh, just very quickly, I just want to touch on um, the uh, ZDP and uh, LSP permits because, you know, uh, those also seem to be causing quite a bit of uh, consternation. The Lesotho special permits, for example, I see uh, there are reports that people are very worried about uh, going home over the festive and whether they would be able to come back. ZDP as well. If you could just give us a quick comment on that. Uh, well, uh, because we have not yet dealt with the Lesotho exemption permit, let me deal with the ZDP. Sakina, I've always repeated, to, 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 for me to deal with it, you really need to understand the background. If you don't understand the background, it will be very difficult. You will know that we passed the Refugee Act in 1998, and at the time we passed it, there were winds of change all over the continent. Things were stabilizing. Constitutions were drawn in countries that did not have constitutions. Uh, countries that used to be ruled by dictators forever started changing that and, and say you can only have two terms of, or three terms. Countries that were ruled by coups, AU, uh, uh, declared them uh, uh, illegal and said they can no longer recognize them, etc. So things were looking very good. And that's the year in which we enacted, is the era in which we enacted the Refugee Act, which means we designed it for, for good times, for times of peace, no problems, no disturbances. Now, to show that, to prove that, that very same year in 1998, 11,000 people came to South Africa asking for refugee status. From there, the figure keeps on increasing. It even reached 53,000 in 2006. But all of a sudden, in, in 2008, it jumped to more than 200,000. And the system got overwhelmed and shocked. While it was still trying to see how to deal with this shock and being overwhelmed, uh, in 2009, more than 200,000 again arrived. And, and the system was not designed to deal with them. And mm. that those years coincided with the economic collapse of 2008 where we also suffered a, 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 a lot, but people believe South Africa was still stable. We also went into a recession, by the way, in mm. 2008. Minister? But it also coincided with the problems in Zimbabwe. So the, the refugee status determination officers could not deal with this issue. Then there was an agreement that let's give them a special deal, which is not in the law. Let's give them special payments, which are not necessary okay. in our acts. Minister? I apologize. Yes. We are out of time. But of course, uh, we'll try and get that uh, from you and um, uh, we'll uh, feed that answer back to our viewers. Dr. Aaron Mutsualede is the Minister of Home Affairs.